Okay. Am I on? Yes. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Welcome everyone to the Astronomical Society of Edinburgh. Sorry about the slight delay there. Um, New Year rustiness, I think. You can put it down to. Uh, we'll not bother with the five-minute countdown. Um, Happy New Year to you all as well. Um, we haven't said that already. Uh, it's quite a significant year for us as a society because when we get to the 15th of October this year, well, that should be our 100th year of existence. Our birthday is on the 15th of October 2024. So we're entering our 100th year, so it's quite exciting. <laughs> this is what we've got coming up tonight. Um, we've got a few um, news and update items for the society. That's better. Um, I'll go through what's coming up um, over the next few months, talk-wise. And then we have the main event of the evening from Rio Urban, claiming the sky back. And Nigel Goodman will tell us about the sky in January. And after that, there's um, tea, coffee, and chat. And for members, you may remember that um, the Royal Observatory very kindly gave us lots of bits of astro kit. Um, and a lot of people have expressed interest. So Ron Morley has got it all at the back, which you may have seen on the way in. Go and negotiate with Ron, and I'm sure um, he'll do you a deal. It's all free from the RE. They gave it to us. Um, but just, just see what's there and see if there's anything that you would like. Um, that's what we've got tonight. Um, we've got new members. Um, our latest four new members, Ivor, Mike, Gareth, and Louise. I don't know if any of them are here tonight. Yeah. Can you welcome them as normal? <laughs> and our membership is very healthy, 189, uh, which is great. Um, just a reminder, a final reminder for our members who haven't uh, renewed yet. It was due on the 1st of October. Your time is running out. And it's um, great value for money, obviously. And is, um, is Alan here tonight? Yes, he is. So you can pay Alan some money or he'll call you or something. Lots of ways to stay in touch with us. Um, our website has everything that's going on. Our Facebook page, Twitter feed. Um, we still do have a Twitter feed at the moment. Um, all our videos of all our talks for the last few years are on our YouTube channel. And you can see all the amazing images created by our members on our um, Flickr group. A few updates as ever. Um, Alan pick up very kindly um, writes um, the sky in of the month and he's done the sky in January. As, as always, that's on our website. Um, I think it's an amazing resource we have. Thank you, Alan, for doing that. He's done it for decades for various people, including the Guardian and Scotsman. I still does it for the Scotsman, don't you, as well? Thank you for that, Alan. Um, but always, always look for that on our website at the start of every month. Um, our telescope help shop on the 25th of February is now full. It filled up very quickly, as it usually does, but we will run it as um, often as we have interest, as there's demand for it. It's always really popular. Uh, I mentioned the, the kit at the back. For members, the image of the quarter for January to March is now active, so um, get your pictures into me if you want to enter into that. It's been very successful over the last year, and these are some examples of... If you can see them, we can put the lights down. Um, examples of, of what we've had over um, the last year, some amazing images. And in December, we had the winner of the image of the year with Ramsey McIver's Masai Mara Milky Way mosaic, very alliterative. Meetings coming up soon. <coughs> um, every month after the, after the first Friday of the month, we have, on, on a Wednesday, we have an image observing group, and that is for members only, that's spooky. Um, uh, our next talk is on the 20th of January. That's an online only talk from Clara Brasseur from St. Andrews on data sonification, turning astronomy data into sound. On the 3rd of February, um, using computer simulations to model the formation of stars on their disks from Dr. James Worcester. That's here again and also online. And we will definitely have the technology working better for that. Um, <laughs> on the 8th of February, our Imaging and Observing Group 
it has a, a particular focus. We sometimes get guest speakers along to those, and we'll have Paul Hearn from the BAA talking about amateur radio astronomy. 17th of February, The Last Stargazers from Emily Levesque, online only, that is. That's about the life of astronomers today. Um, 3rd of March, again, here and online, The Life of a Planetary System from Dr. Thomas Wilson. And 8th of March, our Imaging and Observing Group for members only is um, with Nick James of the BAA, um, all about comets. Nick is incredibly knowledgeable about comets, probably one of the most knowledgeable amateurs around. And 14th of March, online only, is about the Cherenkov Telescope Array from Dr. Robert, Roberta Zinin. Lots to look forward to, um, but this is what we've got to look forward to tonight. So we have Ria. So Ria, if you'd like to, like to come up. Um, Ria is, a, uh, is actually an ASC member, but also a, a space journalist. You can see all the things that she does there. Maybe she'll tell you about them as well. <laughs> Right. So I'm Victoria Urban, which is Ria for short. I know it's very confusing, but Victoria and Ria, same person. Um, and first of all, I want to tell you why I'm here to talk to you about space debris. So I studied at the Edinburgh Napier University. I graduated as a journalist. Um, and now I'm doing a course at the Open University. I'm just finishing astronomy and planetary science. I used to be a senior editor at Space Watch Global, and now I'm an editorial director at Space Impulse, uh, which you have to read. It's amazing. Space magazine. And I would like to start with a quote because I'm old fashioned. Theodore Roosevelt said, keep your eyes on the stars and your feet on the ground. Now, keeping our feet on the ground is very easy. And keeping our eyes on the stars is getting harder and harder. And I'm going to talk about why that is. Um, I'm going to talk about the past year and all that happened up in the sky, all that we sent up and all the things that didn't come down, but have to come down one day. Uh, and then you're going to be very sad. And then at the end of the talk, I'm planning to cheer you up by telling you what the world, the UK and Scotland is doing specifically to get rid of the space debris up there if that's okay. Right, so why can't we see the stars? You know this because you're all astronomers. So you might say that, oh, it's light pollution. And yes, it, it is light pollution. That's a light pollution map of the UK. It's lovely. Uh, wherever it's red, that's the most uh, polluted area. And we can see that in Scotland, we have some hope. We have some dark patches. But that's not all. Obviously, there's the moon, the light of the moon. It can obscure the stars. Um, then there are clouds in Scotland. I don't know if you noticed. Um, <laughs> so months can go by before you can see the stars in their full glory. Um, obviously, with light pollution come a lot of things like glare and uh, light trespass clutter. You know about these things. And then there's space debris and all the satellites that we send up. You know that there are dark sky maps, right? So there are places on the internet, not the dark web, but you can find um, dark maps um, of Scotland and the whole of UK. And you can check where to go um, if you want to see some nice stars. Does anyone know what this is? It's written there. <laughs> okay so this is a grain of cosmic dust and this is the first thing um that actually obscures the sky for us approximately five to three hundred tons of cosmic dust reaches the atmosphere on a daily basis so that's a lot of dust um and it's natural dust it would come here anyway but then we have all the lovely space debris that collide with each other or burn up in the atmosphere. And obviously there's dust coming from that as well. Well, not if they burn up. ESA um, defined what space debris is. And they say it's all functional artificial objects, including fragments and elements thereof in Earth orbit and re-entering into Earth's atmosphere. So everything basically that we send up. And this is one of my favorite um, pictures, graphs of Earth. If you check what the colors mean, so there are active satellites, defunct satellites, um, 
the orange is the active satellites. Now you don't really see a lot of orange there, do you? Um, the most that you see is pink, which is uncategorized. We don't know what they are, but they're there. Um, and then we have debris, which is a gray rocket bodies in purple. Blue are the inactive satellites. And we're going to go closer. So this is low Earth orbit and a bit of medium Earth orbit is a bit busy. Um, just last year, we sent up 1700 satellites. So there's definitely a lot of things up there. So that's either space debris already or is going to be space debris. And they don't usually come down. So most things just stay up there, orbit around the Earth, and most people don't really care about it, but we do. This map is called Astriograph, but there are a lot of versions of this, actually. Okay, so the problem with these objects is that they collide and then they break up into smaller pieces. This is called the Kessler effect. I'm sure you heard about this. And all of these pieces are of different size. Um, they orbit at different speeds and in different orbits. And we currently don't have the technology to track anything below 10 centimeters of size. So everything that's there, that's above 10 centimeters. And there's the rest. Right, so if this orbiting space debris hits a key infrastructure up there, obviously that's a problem as well, because um, we use satellites in our everyday lives. So we use it for our banking, our GPS navigation, uh, TV. Um, we use it for a lot of things. And space debris can also um, endanger astronauts' life on the ISS. Um, my dear friend, a space dynamicist and um, space environmentalist, Mori Baja, Dr. Mori Baja, uh, said that if a space, a piece of space debris, the size of a mobile phone hits the ISS, it can wipe out life on it in, at an instance. Um, right. So we know that a lot of damage has been done um, because of space debris. So on the ISS, if we just stay there, there's the Canada arm, robotic arm that was hit by space debris. So there's a hole in it. Uh, it's still functional, but there's a hole in it. And in 2016, I'm sure you've seen um, the photo that ESA astronaut Tim Peake took of the window of the ISS. There's a chip on it. Um, the ISS constantly has to conduct avoidance maneuvers or the ISS has to be evacuated because of space debris. Um, then there are rocket bodies like the Chinese Long March rockets, um, which we all heard of. They just re-enter Earth um, on, in an uncontrolled way and it actually fell onto some houses. So it can endanger our lives as well. Um, Bigger space debris, um, like there are pieces of space debris the size of a bus up there, not to talk about Elon Musk's Tesla that he launched up there. Um, so if these things um, come down, they don't necessarily burn up in the Earth's atmosphere and bigger chunks can crash into the Earth. And then there was the Russian anti-satellite um, missile test. Uh, in November last year, I think, or was it before? No, in 2021. Um, they basically fired at their own satellite and it broke into millions of pieces. And uh, all in all, there are about 4,500 close approaches to key infrastructure every year, and the satellites can't always be moved. But we don't really care about that. We care about observational astronomy. we still have to know what's obstructing our view. So according to ESA, there's about 128 million pieces of debris smaller than a centimeter, but that's obvious an estimation because we can't track that. About 900,000 pieces of space junk under 10 centimeters. Again, we can track these. 
and there's 34,000 um, pieces over 10 centimeters in size about the Earth. And that's data from a year or two ago, so I'm sure it's a lot more than more now. And there are also thousands of active satellites, um, of which 1,700 were launched last year in 2022. And I'm sure you know about Starlink. They uh, have a lot of sat satellites up uh, in the sky, and some of them are really, really shiny. And they, because they reflect sunlight, not the satellite is shiny. Um, and they promise to do something about it um, to launch the second generation of satellites um, painted or with some other technology so that they will be dimmed a bit. Right. Okay, good news. Rwanda announced last year plans to launch a constellation of 327,320 uh, satellites. So that's 330,000 satellites approximately that Rwanda wants to launch. And that's just one country. And obviously Rwanda, we, we're not sure that it's going to happen, but still they applied um, for, uh, for it to happen. And there are other countries and uh, other organizations that want to launch their own uh, satellites because they don't want to wait for uh, data from shared satellites. And uh, another 20,000 satellites are to be added to this already congested orbit that we saw there in the next five years. And that's low Earth orbit and geostationary orbit mainly. And here's another beautiful quote for you from Professor. So he's talking about looking up in the sky and seeing the stars. So it's a human heritage and we all have the right um, to be able to view and examine the stars, but obviously that's being taken away. So when we talk about sustainable space, it's important to establish what we mean about that. Satellites are important, as we said, we use them for a lot of things. We even use satellites for Earth observation and to mitigate climate change issues here on Earth uh, for agriculture, agriculture, fishery. I'm sorry, I can't speak English. It's the end of the week. Um, right. So countries and companies are planning mega constellations, as you know, and they keep uh, sending them up. However, Mean, being sustainable means that, yes, they can do this because we need it, but we can't exhaust the orbits in space around Earth. And it means that although technical developments are necessary, there should be limits and agreements to preserve the environment, the orbital environment. And that's what a lot of lawyers are working on, actually, space lawyers. And there have been some suggestions, some of which are very funny, like the first one. So they suggest moving the telescopes from the face of the Earth to the far side of the moon. Great, but who's going to pay for it? Because I don't have the money to do that. I don't know if you do. Um, space telescopes. We have a lot of space telescopes. So why why bother um, with Earth-based one, Earth ones? Because I don't have access to JWST. I don't know if you do. Um, they say we need a global database before anything can be legislated. And this is a very valid point. So legislation is not possible and international treaties are not enforceable unless we monitor, verify and inspect what's going on up there. And the first thing to, is to establish the data, um, what's needed and then retrieving the data so that we can work from it and analyze it. So accurate measurements are needed and they call astronomers help for that. They want astronomers to help with methods um, used to detect and characterize asteroids to detect and characterize these space debris. And the other thing that's very important is transparency from countries, um, governments, which for example, China is a very bad example of. Um, they never tell us where, where the rocket is going to land. So that will have, has, have to change. 
and the good news. Um, so governments are obviously are more and more aware of what's going on um, up there. So there have been quite a few measures already put in place in the just in the past year, and there's going to be more. So you can see this direct ascent uh, anti-satellite test bands, the first one. Um, so it has been signed, I think it's 10 countries now. Uh, yes, it is. So it's France, uh, U the US, Australia, Canada, Germany, Japan, New Zealand, South Korea, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom. And I believe China was about to sign it as well. So um, they promised not to do what Russia, what Russia did um, two years ago. So they're not going to send missiles to um, fire at their own satellites. Of course, we don't know if there's a war situation, what will happen if this is going to change and we will start firing at each other's satellites, but that's another story. Um, the second point you see up there is the five-year deorbit rule. That's the Federal Communications Commissions in the U uh, Commission at the US. Um, they approved the rule to shorten the time that satellite operators should deorbit their defunct satellites. So it was 25 years previously, and now they shortened that time down to five years, and they have to safely deorbit their spacecraft. And then there is the space sustainability rating, which unfortunately uh, is voluntary, but it's a good idea. Um, it was launched in June last year. It's hosted by the eSpace Space Center, and it will allow space operators to improve their mission sustainability by obtaining a rating um, after assessments and actionable guidance um, and support that they get from the SSR. Um, they offer tailored and actionable practical guidance uh, to enhance the mission sustainability level. And what they want to achieve is um, for companies and governments to only use um, companies that are within this rating. Um, they're building a lot of reusable satellites nowadays, which is good. And uh, they started on-orbit servicing and lifetime extension for these satellites. Um, there are a lot of visualization, visual, I can't speak English, I told you, visualization tools uh, like Scout and Privateer. Um, they joined forces. Um, Privateer is a data intelligence platform. Um, it's just like Astria Graph that I showed you with all the satellites up there. Um, so this collaboration um, will integrate Scout's data collection capabilities and Privateer's platform, um, which is called Wayfinder. And it will be an open access, near real-time visualization of spacecraft and space debris orbiting Earth. And the companies will also explore the possibility of joint offerings to enhance their space data sets. And of course, they're building awareness um, with this as well. Um, Dr. Moribaja, who I mentioned, has a project named Eyes on the Sky, um, which is basically a VR tour of low Earth and uh, mid Earth orbits and the ISS. And you can see for yourself uh, how much space debris uh, there is. It's very cool. And now we're coming closer to home. So, it's um, the UK now. Have you heard about ELSA-D and ELSA-M or Astroscale? So Astroscale is a Japanese company with a UK business here as well. And they have something called the ELSA-D um, mission, which was already tested. It's a magnetic capture system. So they sent the satellite up or the spacecraft up and it catches whatever it needs to catch. And I have a video to show you regarding this, if I find it, yay. Okay, I'll stop talking, enjoy. Very dramatic music.
Let's stay here now. <laughs> I'm going to show you something else because I now I, I see I have time to show you something else as well. Right, so that was AstroScale. That's the ELSA D, the magnetic capture system. Um, and the UK Space Agency granted 1.9 million euros um, to upgrade this project because obviously not all satellites or spacecraft up there have this magnetic bit that they can uh, capture. So now AstroScale is working on ELSA M which is a multiple capture system and it's a robotic arm basically that captures the spacecraft and it's called a multiple uh, system because it's going to be able to catch multiple satellites on one mission wow um right so astroscale is planning um to launch asa m in 2026 and they want to make it a norm uh, by 2030 to use this service and um, the UK Space Agency um, actually awarded 2.46 million US dollars I don't know why I didn't convert this um, into euros or pounds um, to clear space that's another UK company to clear up space and their mission is called clear um, who would have thought and um, they've already um, conducted the feasibility study, so the technology should work. Um, and CLEAR will remove at least two UK registered low Earth orbit satellites uh, from space. And the second phase of this contract highlights the UK's commitment to establishing a safe and sustainable space environment. But it's not only the UK, but Scotland within the UK that we're interested in, which I'm going to show you shortly. But before that, I told you that there were visualiz visualization tools. Why can't I pronounce this word? Someone say it. visualization tools. And I'm going to show you one of them. One second. This is very cool. This is a town like many, many others. There's nothing particularly unique about this town. It's peaceful, it's safe. I don't wanna give it all away just yet, but I have to tell you a few things. Things aren't quite what they appear to be. We're in a state of disharmony with our environment and it's actually not about just what's going on on earth. It's about what's happening in space. Hi, my name is Morba Ja. I'm an astrodynamicist, a space environmentalist, and an associate professor of aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at the University of Texas at Austin. Together with a group of students and faculty, we're trying to make a difference. It's a project called Eyes on the Sky. Why? Let me show you something. Currently working on a prototype to deliver a different kind of experience because when it comes to solving wicked problems, we need to find new ways to tackle them and raise awareness. What we're trying to do is investigate new ways of storytelling. Me, I'm a scientist, I have lots of data, but I can't just show people data and it makes sense. I want my audience to be all of you, to be humanity itself. And for this to be successful, we're investigating this thing called mixed reality, which is a fusion of both physical and digital experiences. We're developing this prototype called the Sky Dome. Basically, it's an immersive portal. In essence, it can take you anywhere in the universe and make you believe it. All these dots that you see swirling around me, these things are mostly space garbage, space debris, different orbital altitudes, orbital highways, moving in near real time. And a lot of this number crunching is happening at the Texas Advanced Computing Center as we speak.
here's the Earth. But what I really want to show you is where the International Space Station is located right now. In order to really understand this problem of space debris, let's go a little bit closer to home. Okay, welcome to Near Earth Orbit and the International Space Station. This is what the view of the Earth would look like if we were on board the space station, which is orbiting the Earth at about 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface. As you can see, it's already quite busy up here and it's gonna get busier all the time. Remember those yellow dots in astrograph? Well, these yellow dots represent dead satellites, pieces of debris, just like this satellite that you see drifting behind me. Unfortunately, 95% of all the objects that we track orbiting the Earth are like this one, basically dead pieces of junk. As it turns out, all this debris orbiting the Earth can cause a whole lot of damage. In fact, something the size of my cell phone could punch right through the International Space Station or take out an entire network of communication. Very dramatic. That was it. So yeah, the problem with space debris up there is that they have the speed of about 17,500 miles per hour. So that's, that's fast. Right. And now back to Scotland. I only have one slide left. I don't think it's worth um, doing this. Right. So Scotland. Um, in September, Space Scotland um, published the Space Sustainability Roadmap or the Space Sustainability Roadmap for Scotland. Um, and this is a, the first strategic document of its kind. Um, the roadmap was um, prepared in collaboration with Astro Agency, Optima, Scot Scottish Enterprise. I'm sure you've heard about these. Um, and it was based on the Environmental Task Force and the Sustainable Space Challenges Initiative. And the roadmap uh, includes recommendations for sustainable development of Scottish space sector with the government, uh, which the government identified as a key opportunity for future economic growth in the country. The roadmap um, con contains 11 detailed work packages in the areas of leadership, in orbit, environment, and net zero, of course. And it also sets three goals for the space sector to achieve by 2020, uh, 2045. 25 would be very ambitious. Um, these goals focus on sustainability on the ground and in orbit as well. And um, it also looks at reducing emissions. And the Environmental Task Force uh, aims to share information with other countries to encourage them to establish similar strategies. And um, France has already uh, come on board. And I think that's it. And I have a woman sleeping above a laptop on the very last slide um, because my talk might have been boring. But if you have any questions, here I am. Please ask. Thank you very much. If anyone's got any questions in the room, first of all, put the microphone here. Angel. Oh, no. Thank you very much, Ria. That was a, a fascinating talk and a good update for us from the last time we addressed this uh, particular issue. Um, I think we're, we're all familiar with the doomsday clock for a uh, nuclear conflagration, which seems to have been stuck at one minute to midnight for a long time. Um, if you had a, a doomsday clock for the congestion of uh, Earth orbit, uh, where, in your opinion, would, would it be sitting at this point in time? <laughs> <laughs> good question i i think that the problem is already way too big 
So when when we talk about astronauts having to evacuate constantly and m- maneuvering away, when we have to maneuver satellites away constantly, not to crash into each other, and when we say that there are millions of pieces of space debris that we can track, I think the problem is already too big because they're very dangerous to infrastructure and to astronauts as well. Anyone else in the hall? So just, sorry, just just imagine that when we go to space and we're going back to the moon, rockets, uh, spacecraft have to maneuver in between these um, space debris, which is crazy. Just hold how, oh, sorry. how much does it affect um, telescopes, ground-based telescopes on like a daily basis? A lot. Or would it say a lot? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, if you know where they are, um, you can correct for these if we're talking about the big telescopes, uh, obviously. Um, it, it's fairly easy. But even if we put the telescopes on the far side of the moon, which was one of the suggestions, there would be satellites there because we already have cislunar satellites and there will be more cislunar satellites. So everything is going to be affected by them. Even as amateur astronomers are already affected by it quite dramatically. Oh, yeah. Big telescopes are not, not to mention the radio astronomy um, telescopes as well. There. I wasn't even going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Peter? Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, there's a lot of you know interesting initiatives but they're all very small scale and it's a very large scale problem. Is anybody working on, you know, a giant dumper truck that can just go around and sweep loads of it up at once? No, <laughs> <laughs> not, not as far as I know. Um, yes, there are initiatives and they're all very small, but all that I mentioned happened just in the last year. So I, I didn't go back um, and, and a lot, is going to happen this year, I believe. So there are more and more companies because the governments are outsourcing these as well. It's cheaper. So there are a lot of uh, companies dealing with um, cleaning up space. And because there's competition, there's going to be a lot of technological advancement and innovation, I think, in the coming years. So I wanted to make you happy. You don't seem happy. (laughs) It's going to happen. But also, we're going to send more and more satellites up. <laughs> Nanosatellites and CubeSats, which are better because they're smaller, but we're going to send more up. I don't know. Uh, if I understand it right, one of the big problems is ownership. Yes. Oh, yeah. Who owns what and who has authority to do what? And that's probably one of the big legal obstacles to get anything done. Yes, that, that's why space lawyers are emerging, because there are a lot of questions about that. Um, like companies say that, oh, the satellite is not working anymore. It's it's not ours. It was ours while we operated it. Now it's the manufacturers, but the manufacturer says, no, it's not because we manufactured it for the operator. So there's no ownership. That's one huge issue. Yes, it's a global problem and there has to be a global solution. And it has to include governments, industry, and the defense sector as well. But I don't know when it's going to happen. Any questions on Zoom? Anything on the um, on, on YouTube world? Everyone fell asleep. I have a question. Um, Good response, but... What's your opinion of the best way to get rid of junk? There was one question from Douglas Wilson. How do we get rid of this junk? But what's your opinion? Is it going to be some amazing new technological innovation? Or is it going to be um, something which a a whole combination of things? Right. So um, I I live in a dream world. Um, I think that's why I'm an astronomer. Um, Ideally, in my mind, people who put the satellites up would safely deorbit them, but that's not happening. Rocket bodies, Teslas, um, so everything sent up there should come down and the people who put them up there should be responsible, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. Sorry. I'm in my bubble. There's a question. question? I was going to ask um, if you have a sense of how practical it would be 
um, for international negotiations to take place. They're so difficult on the ground and space is so far away. Um, how, what kind of mechanism would it take um, to, to make anything work up there? Well, I think they are recognizing slowly that it, this is a huge issue. And um, I don't think they care so much about astronauts' life, or unfortunately, but or astronomers um, on Earth. But they definitely care about the infrastructure up in space. So I think the space sustainability roadmap um, is is a good thing, and basically scaring people, <laughs> governments, and the defense sector as well. Um, that they're not going to have the satellites needed um, like in a war situation or um, on a daily basis. Like we, we saw how much satellites were needed during the Ukraine situation. Um, so if they understand how crucial satellites are for everyday communication and just our lives, I think they're going to take it more seriously. I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, yes, you did. I mean, when we looked at this on the much more local scale of of um, out of date street lighting and so on causing causing pollution, and we asked ourselves, is there anything that the public can do to change the attitude of people towards their contribution to the to the lighting and so on? This just seems such such a much bigger thing. I can't see what role there is um, apart from voting politics. Yeah. Um... Good point. So the visualization tool, which I can't pronounce all night, um, that I showed you is is one thing that could help. Like if if you think about Earth and um, the environment, we have David Attenborough uh, walking around telling us that we're bad people because we're killing animals and killing the oceans and you know stuff like that, and everyone's aware. But as far as space junk, we don't really have. A, a David Attenborough of space. So Moribaja, in my opinion, Dr. Moribaja is or could be uh, one of these people. Um, so I think we just have to raise awareness and we have to treat space like, I don't know, an ocean or a continent or whatever. Okay, I think we have one last question in the room and then that'll be it. Okay. I read the script of how often things, the stuff that's floating up there, manages not to burn up <laughs> in the atmosphere and actually hit the air or hit the ground, really. Hmm. I don't have the data on that, but the bigger and the more heat resistant the object is, obviously, it's it's not going to burn up. Uh, the, something fell on Australia last year i believe so it, it happens fairly often but it's usually smaller pieces not a whole rocket body like china's long march rocket which did fall on earth a couple of times and not always into the ocean so there's not a huge chance that we will be killed by space debris falling on us but there oh there is always a chance sorry We have one more question, Peter. Yes, we have uh, Big Man. I'm not sure who Big Man is, but Big Man, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, it's, I was wondering, instead of having um, systems which are going to cause these um, unused, unnecessary items in orbit burning up into the atmosphere, would it be worth considering a project to gather them together and deorbit them onto the moon so that there's resources there for future buildings on the moon. If anyone's got any views on that? I think they have thought about that, or at least there was a debate about that. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think it was too expensive to do that. Um, I, I don't want to lie, though. Um, I don't think they're planning to do that. What they're planning to do is to um, reuse satellites that are in orbit if they can. Like um, NASA can um, use satellites that are not functioning. So their original function um, ended 
uh, but they can still use the satellites for something else. That's something that they are planning to do, but not, not taking them to the moon. Okay, well, thank you very much for thank that, Ria. Can we thank Ria again? Um, we're now going to have Nigel Goodness going to tell us about the sky in January. So if you can see yourself up. Uh, why Nigel's um, setting himself up. I've just been handed this here by Graham. Um, about a talk from the Royal Scottish Society of Arts in this um, very building on Monday the 30th of January at 7 p.m. Everyone's welcome. It's called Searching in the Dark by Dr. Zinran Liu, um, a research fellow at the University of Edinburgh. What if everything you could see, touch or feel was only the tip of the iceberg? Ever since the late 1800s, starting with Lord Kelvin, people have postulated that there's more to the universe than that the most powerful tools of science can detect. Over the last hundred years, there has been a growing body of evidence to strongly indicate that our universe and most of the matter in it is indeed dark. Come and explore what scientists know we don't know. So that's here on the 30th of January at 7 p.m. Um, I'll put it on our newsletter for AC members. Okay, thank you. If everybody can hear me, um, so we're going to look at the 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 sky in uh, January. Um, although I'm beginning to feel after Rio's excellent talk and uh, the amount of cloud we've had recently, uh, is it worth it? But yes, it probably is. So. Uh, I'm starting with a wonderful image of the uh, the horse nebula and uh, the, um, the the flame nebula in in Orion uh, from Bill Boner, uh, just to illustrate a little bit about the, some of the treasures that we have waiting in store for us during January. So the sky in January in 2023. Let's look at the highlights. With uh, one has already taken place, which is that uh, the planet Uranus uh, was occulted by the moon. Um, now, unlike the recent occultation of of Mars, uh, Uranus is not a naked sky object. So, but uh, I don't know whether any of our astronomers uh, actually picked that one up. I haven't seen anything, but maybe there's somebody somewhere who's been able to image that happening. It was quite a shallow uh, occultation uh, on the first of January. And we'll come back to that in, in just a moment. Uh, we've also had the quadranted uh, meteor shower, um, which took place, uh, uh, well, has been taking place at the beginning of January and reached its peak um, on the 4th of January. It, it was uh, made a bit difficult by the fact that um, a nearly full moon uh, was was washing out the sky at the time. Um, and it was... It was um, a, so it wasn't easy to see, and also, of course, we we've had a run of bad weather. Um, but a few of our uh, meteor uh, cameras uh, that some of the guys have in the society uh, picked did pick up some of the quadranted meteors. Later in the month, we have a, a conjunction of uh, Venus and Saturn, which we'll be talking about later. And we also have um, the first of this year's uh, comets, which promises. Who knows what might happen with a comet that it might be quite a good one. It might even reach uh, naked eye um, uh, visibility. And there are also uh, uh, three, in fact, there's all the planets are, are in view, but there are three particularly bright planets still in view in our night sky uh, through this month. Let's look uh, just very quickly backward at the quadranted meteor shower. Peaked, as I said, on the 4th of January. Um, the radiant point of this uh, meteor shower is in the constellation of Boetes. Um, so why isn't it called the Boetes meteor shower or the Boated meteor shower? Well, I found out, and I didn't know this, but I'm quite sure that many people in the audience do know this, but for those of you who didn't, um, it's called that because um, the quadrantids were named after a constellation that no longer ex ex exists, Quadrans Muralis, which uh, was invented by a French astronomer 
um, and uh, uh, it, it, in 1745 or some sometime around then, um, but it didn't make the cut when the International Astronomical Union defined the boundaries of the present 88 constellations that we enjoy in the night sky. So it's called, but the, the meteor shower from which it radiated is still called the Quadrantids. And this is uh, an image um, caught by uh, the meteor camera from uh, Pat Devine's camera uh, of one of the first uh, Quadrantids at the beginning of the month. We are still very much a, in, in the, the high country as far as uh, astronomy is concerned because we've got lots of darkness uh, being midwinter. The ephemeris for the sun, sun uh, shows us that uh, uh, we've got data here for the 1st of January, for the middle of the month on the 15th of January, and for the end of January on the 31st. And you can see that uh, between uh, astronomical twilight uh, ending and astronomical twilight beginning again in the morning uh, as, as the sun begins to rise, um, the, that's the true astronomical darkness. But I think uh, we have sufficient darkness for, us, for astronomy in nautical twilight as well uh, for certain types of astronomy. But if we just look at the uh, actual true darkness, uh, if I've got my mass correct, um, on the 1st of January, uh, we had we get about 12 hours and 11 minutes of true darkness on the middle of the month that has dropped to 11 hours and 49 and by the end of the month it will be 11 hours and six minutes of of true darkness but still plenty of, of of darkness for astronomers to play with let's look at the moon then so these are the phases uh, for the moon um, this month. Uh, tonight is, is a full moon. It's a, a wolf moon for people who are interested in these, uh, uh, that nomen nomenclature. I can't say that. <laughs> um, the full moon is, is tonight. Uh, the last quarter uh, of the waning moon uh, is on January the 15th. January the 21st uh, will be the new moon. And the first quarter uh, is on January the 28th. The full moon uh, is uh, at, at present at lunar apogee, which means it's on the furthest away point in its orbit of the Earth. So it's appearing smaller and dimmer uh, than, than an average, um, but it's not something I don't think that most people just looking at the moon would, would immediately spot, um, but it's just an interesting fact. Dark sky observing uh, or dark sky imaging would be best uh, if you want to capture uh, deep sky objects uh, between the last quarter and the first quarter. In other words, uh, in the second half of, of this, uh, this month. The moon itself has several close encounters with uh, other planetary bodies in the, in the solar system um, from the point of view of, of line of sight, not actual close encounters. Um, on the 3rd of January, a 91% lit uh, waxing moon was near the uh, planet Mars. And on the 23rd of January, a 5% lit waxing moon will be near to Venus and Saturn. We'll, we'll talk about that again uh, because they'll be in conjunction and it should be actually quite a nice photographic object for people um, uh, with uh, wide field uh, equipment. On the 25th of January, the 21% lit waxing moon will be near the planet Jupiter. And on the 30th of January, uh, the 64% lit waxing moon will be near the Pleiades. And again, that, that would actually make uh, a, quite a beautiful um, photograph, I think, uh, on, in a wide field telescope. And on the 31st of January, the 73% lit waxing moon again will be near to Mars. And I just included this, uh, since we're talking about the moon, uh, this uh, nice image from Horst um, of uh, a, the Lunar 100, the ASC Lunar 100, number 95. And your homework for this evening is to get onto the, the website of the Society, uh, if you don't know it already, and find out what uh, number 95 is in the Lunar 100. 
um, which is always an interesting exercise. Let's look at the constellations. So facing east, the main uh, prominent feature, I would say, uh, the circumpolar stars are always with us. The circumpolar constellations are always with us, um, but certain constellations uh, belong to the winter. And Leo, uh, certainly, as well as Orion, is, is one of these. So Leo is uh, becoming more and more prominent now, uh, rising in the east as the, um, as the month progresses. And these are just, uh, uh, there are so many deep sky objects and beautiful things to observe and to photograph in the night sky, but this is the, um, uh, the a cluster of, of three galaxies uh, in Leo by Ian Smith. <clears throat> Turning uh, around a little bit to the south, uh, Orion dominates the, the night sky. Um, with uh, Sirius and Canis Major uh, following on at his heels. Uh, 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 Cancer with Castor and Pollux and the twins are also high in the sky, um, as, as is Taurus and the Pleiades. So it's a well-known um, group of stars. And you have the winter hexagon, uh, which is, a, 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 once you actually spot it in the night sky, you can't unspot it. And if you draw a line between uh, Sirius, I don't, I don't know if you can see my cursor, yes you can, uh, between uh, Sirius and uh, Procyon, and then uh, up to uh, uh, to Ariga to, um, uh, help me out here, what's the star of the, yeah, cast it to Pollux, that's right, and then up to um, Capella, thank you very much, and then back down to Aldebaran, and down to um, Rigel. Uh, and then back to Sirius, and that, that is the winter hexagon. And there are so many deep sky objects within that area that it's just uh, it's, it's too much to, to really uh, to show images of all these things, but there is some wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, nebulae and um, uh, uh, objects of, of um, uh, galaxy objects and so on uh, in, in that part of the, the night sky. And just to show a couple of these, uh, on the left-hand side there is uh, a wonderful uh, monochrome image of the Orion Nebula, M42, uh, by, by Mark, and Ian Smith with the Flaming Star Nebula, which is in Origa. Turning around again, we're facing west. And uh, immediately, uh, one of the constellations, uh, which is a, a wonderful constellation for galaxies, um, as well as other deep sky objects, uh, Andromeda, is beginning to uh, set it, setting very uh, fast now in the West, and will soon be losing uh, Andromeda for the for the for the springtime and, and the summer. Um, And I just thought I'd show this wonderful um, uh, image of the Andromeda Galaxy M31 uh, by Mike McGovern that he spent many, many hours on. And uh, hey, they, they were not wasted hours. Beautiful. Turning around again to the north, um, the highlight uh, really of, of the north is that uh, Cygnus is now dropping uh, uh, low in the north, but we have our circumpolar uh, uh, constellations in full view. Uh, uh, we've got uh, um, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, um, Cassiopeia, um, the Milky Way uh, stretching across our, our heads. And Eros Tang gave us this beautiful uh, view of the Wizard Nebula in Cepheus, which is a, a circumpolar constellation. So let's turn our attention now to the planets. All, as I said earlier, all the planets will be visible this month, but three of the bright planets uh, really stand out. Mars. Mars is in Taurus uh, at the moment, quite close to the Pleiades. And although its apparent size diminishes through the month, it's still bright and a great telescopic object. 
in the first week of January, it appears to be moving west against the background of stars, a retrograde motion. This is to do with the geometry of the orbits of Earth and Mars, where uh, Earth will uh, overtake Mars because it's closer into the sun. Um, so you get the, the although it doesn't actually reverse it, its movement, it looks as if it does from our point of view. So it goes into a, what's called a retrograde motion. And then after it reaches a, a stationary point, a hesitation, if you like, uh, on the 12th of this month, uh, it appears to start moving uh, east again, in, in other words, in a prograde uh, motion. And um, that might be something that might be an interesting uh, project for a series of, of uh, uh, wide angle um, images. Uh, just to to try and capture a sequence of photographs so that you can see both the retrograde motion and the, the prograde motion. And I'm not giving myself that job to do. So if anybody's interested in doing that and the clouds, the clouds uh, work with us, that might be quite an interesting thing to do. And this is a lovely image of Mars uh, taken recently by Andrew Farrell. Jupiter. It's in Pisces at the moment and still very bright. Uh, it's still a bright, obvious object. Um, but it's the window for observing uh, this, this planet, uh, which has, has been marvelous uh, all through the latter half of last year. And uh, uh, But uh, it's beginning to close now. So if you're going to, to, to take some, and I'm telling myself this as well, if you're going to take some images of, of Jupiter, you better get on with it. And this again, uh, Andrew was busy with his uh, telescope, and it's another image of, of Jupiter taken quite recently. Venus. Venus is, uh, is, is bright and low in the southwest after sunset, uh, but its altitude will be increasing uh, through the month. Uh, it has a close encounter with Saturn on the 22nd of January. And the following evening, uh, as, as we'll come to, um, both the planets appear very close to a very thin uh, and beautiful crescent moon. Uh, as always, if you're, if you're seeking out Venus uh, when it's so low in, in the night sky, uh, be very, very careful, be very sure whether you're wanting to look at it uh, after sunset or before sunrise, uh, that you don't get blinded by the rising sun or the setting sun. So make sure that the sun is out of the way before you start sweeping for, for Venus at that low altitude. Mercury. Mercury is a very difficult target to spot, um, much less photograph. Um, but there is a, a good chance to photograph uh, to spot Mercury in January. Uh, late in the month uh, would be the best time. Before sunrise, it will be at its greatest western elongation on the 30th and 31st of the month in the southeast sky. Um, it's also an evening object close to Venus and a morning object after the 7th. So you can take your choice. You can either stay up or uh, get up early. Um, and it's only going to be 16 degrees to the right of a waning crescent moon. Um, so it, it's, it's, as I say, it's, it's bright, but it's quite a small, difficult object to see, especially since it's so low uh, in the sky. Um, uh, so the, the, the moon might be quite a good uh, guide to, to finding it visually. And Saturn. Saturn's fading now from our night sky, uh, but it goes out with a bang on the 22nd of January, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the next item. Uranus and Neptune, two furthest away gas giants. Uh, Neptune is in Aries, uh, and uh, uh, the Neptune's in Aries and Aquarius, uh, Aquarius respectively. Neptune in Aries and uh, Uranus in, in Aquarius, Aquarius, sorry, respectively, all month. Uranus is near the moon early in early January. So again, you can use the moon as a signpost to, to try and find uh, Uranus, for which you will need a, at least a small telescope. Uh, and Neptune uh, is, will be near Jupiter on the 1st of January. Both planets are either side and just south of a, wane, of a waxing crescent moon on the 25th of January. So again, another possibility for uh, an interesting, interesting uh, image. Okay, the, the other um, 
main topic was uh, Saturn uh, meeting Venus, as, as I said, going out with a bang. Uh, on the 22nd of January, uh, low in the southwest after sunset. The, the two uh, uh, bodies, the two planets, will appear to be only 22 uh, arc minutes apart. Now, uh, reading different uh, places, it's either 22 or 24 or 23 arc minutes, but they're bloody close. So um, a, a, it, it should be quite spectacular. And uh, that's just a, a chart of, of uh, where they'll be situated, situated on the 22nd of January. And as I say, the following day, on 23rd, they'll be joined by a, a, a very thin, I think it's about 5% lit crescent moon, uh, which should be making, making an interesting image. And after that, uh, uh, after January is over, uh, we are basically waving goodbye to, to Saturn for a while. And the, the new comet, uh, which I mentioned, which is uh, named C slash 2022 E3 brackets ZTF close brackets. Um, it's already a telescopic object, uh, but it may brighten, although you can never tell with a comet, it may brighten to naked eye visibility as it heads north uh, throughout the month uh, from Corona Borealis uh, to uh, Ursa Minor. And here's a little chart just of that track. Uh, you can see here on the 1st of January, if you can see my cursor, um, it's moving in a track. Uh, it's just to the south. Uh, east of the Keystone um, in Hercules, and then it's tracking sort of northeast um, through Draco uh, uh, and over the top, as it were, of uh, Buetes and Ursa Major, and then uh, doing a fly past of uh, Kochab in Ursa Minor to uh, end up um, quite near Polaris uh, on the 31st of January. Uh, it reaches perihelion, its closest point to the sun on the, the, the 12th. Now, that's a snappy name for any comet. So uh, I didn't know how, it, how these things are designated, but for those of you who don't know, uh, the, the, the C designation, C slash designation, indicates that it's not a periodic comet. So it's a one time only visitor to uh, our skies. It was discovered in 2022, which makes sense. The, the E uh, means it was found in March, and it was the third comet found in that, in that uh, month. Uh, and it was discovered by the Zwicky Transient Facility. Well, I think one of the best opportunities to, to take a look at the comet uh, when it reaches full brightness, we hope, um, it will be when it's near uh, Ursa Minor, and this is just a closer look at times uh, and positions uh, for that uh, close flyby of uh, uh, the little bear. And just to finish off, this is a, 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 an interesting uh, image of the comet uh, taken by, by Ian Smith, and another by Peter Black just recently. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nigel. That's really good. Um, that's it for us tonight. Uh, is there anything else I've forgotten? Which is always possible. Um, thank you very much, Ria, for the talk. Thank you, Nigel, for doing that. Thank you for everyone for coming. It's tea and coffee at the back. Um, hang around for a chat. Remember, there's a lot of um, wonderful AC, uh, ROE kit over there, which um, is to be given away. Negotiate with Ron and see what you want and what, and what works for you. And uh, we'll see you online again. Um, I can't remember when that was. Next online meeting is on the 20th of January, and we'll be back here on the 3rd of February. So see you then. Thank you. Oh, hold on. Hello. Hello. Hello.
it is, uh, is uh, cultivation and nudging and whatever. But can we just say, uh, last one. 